So this week, this week, uh, I can wait. Now I know how you feel on Thursday mornings. Uh, so I have to admit, I'm going to admit to you beforehand that uh, this is what I would call a foggy brain sermon. Uh, this week, you can probably tell by my voice, but I, I'm getting over my cold. I, I think I'm over it other than the sound. Uh, <laughs> I'm getting the look. Um, but uh, it has been a week, and um, one, uh, I did get pretty sick. Uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday. Like, I was just in bed on uh, Thursday. And so, uh, so hopefully it doesn't reflect on my sermon that much. Uh, but twofold to this, I'm just going to uh, selfishly use the platform that's given to me. Uh, and I didn't even ask my mom permission for this, but I would love if you guys would pray for my mom. Uh, I shared with you guys a while ago that my mom diagnosed with cancer. Uh, she has, I can share this stuff, right? She has COPD, but she caught pneumonia. And she's in the hospital, and it's, it's a rough moment for our family. And so if you'd be just praying for her, that'd be great. Uh, and then the fact that, like, I, there's no way I could go down and see her right now because uh, I would, would not want to make anything worse. And so hopefully I get better by maybe enough to go see her uh, here soon. So, um, but uh, this week I had an opportunity to kind of dive in before I got sick and then took a break and then kind of re-picked it back up. And hopefully everything makes sense. I mean, does it ever really make sense, though? Uh, for me, uh, but we're kind of, I see that we, I left the Thief series up there, it's kind of, we're like moving on, this is kind of a standalone uh, thing, but we're picking up from the, what we focused on during the last series in hopes of us um, kind of uh, building on this idea of what we've looked at, the valuing of stuff. Uh, we talked about uh, the value of material items and the things we treasure and we gather up here uh, on earth and the high value, we, high value we even put on things that, are, that aren't necessarily physical uh, or monetary uh, things and how we uh, value, we value uh, things of life in, 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 in uh, aspects of life sometimes, uh, how our life is made up. Uh, in the last two weeks, we've made some practical responses, which I really enjoyed for myself personally in, in, in kind of being a part of a church that's willing to, to kind of step up and say, hey, here's some things in some ways I want to respond to God actively. And so the last two weeks, we've been able to make some practical responses and recognizing the situations that we're in. And we had a moment of surrender a couple weeks ago. Um, uh, and uh, offering up and releasing things that we've held on to last week with, that, with the ideas of where we landed last week. And the effort of this last series in, is that we continue to point everything back to Jesus. Everything directly should point back to uh, Jesus and in, in, in who he is uh, and uh, the, life, the, the, the life that he wants to direct us Towards, to live in, to operate, to grow into uh, in our lives. And last week, we specifically talked about the heart in the transition from idea head to heart and then the outflow of that uh, and what we've allowed to take root in our lives and, uh, gr and, uh, and what we've grabbed a hold of because of the value we've placed on it and maybe even placed that in a position in our heart and whether or not that was healthy. And so uh, this morning, we're going to look at, uh, uh, we're going to kind of start off with this Old Testament verse, but it's kind of a cry. You probably prayed it before or heard it prayed uh, before. Uh, it's in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Uh, and it says, Hear, O Israel, and this is like that moment where, it, like, it's like, all right, stop and listen to what, what's about to be said. The focus is, Hear, O Israel, that means like, you know, for us, it means, all right, disconnect from social media. Like, listen to this. This is, this, is what, this is what I have for you. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commands 
I give to you. And, and here's the deal, church. All the stuff that we value in life, um, all that we give worth to, all that we work to obtain, all that we build up and achieve our life, separate from the gospel of Jesus Christ, separate from uh, loving and uh, giving our life to Jesus, um, separate from that, are, they are a desire of our body, of the flesh, is what you've probably heard it called before uh, in, in, in church. And if you were uh, like me last week, the thing that I opened up to release with my hand, I, I think it was like Monday afternoon, I found myself like grasping at it again and, and wanting to hold on to it. And, and that's that idea of our flesh taking over. That's the idea of our earthly body uh, taking over and, 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 and desiring uh, to, uh, to uh, operate in a certain way. Uh, and, and so you're going to have to hang with me just here for a second as, we, as I try to kind of explain myself. We all have a body. Um, and even in the scripture in Deuteronomy, it kind of relates to this. Uh, God has given us this body here on earth to do the work that he's laid out for us, right? He's, uh, he's given us this physical body here to do the work that he's called us to do. Now our head and our heart are a part of our body, right? They're a part of our physical body here on earth, uh, this temporary body that we have. And because of that, our head and our heart can be led astray, right? I'm not going to make you raise your hand if you admit that your head or your heart has ever been led astray. Uh, we'd all have to raise our hand, or then we'll talk about it later. We become liars. Um, but um, our head and our heart of our physical body, because it's a part of the temporary physical body that we have, they can be led astray. Uh, and, and that's kind of what we've been focusing on and how our hearts and our minds can go after things in life, can go after desires uh, and things in life. And, and much like, and I thought about this as I was sick, much like my body was sick last week, uh, and I'm kind of getting over it still, like, uh, that is, in an essence, uh, how our physical body is when we go after the things that aren't of God. We have that sickness, that desire in us to go after things repeatedly or let go of things and then grasp them back up because of, because of uh, the earthly and temporariness of our body. Uh, but our body being temporary leads us to the idea that we all, each one of us, were given a soul. And it's our soul that is eternal. Right? God uh, designed us and gave us this soul, and the desire of our soul is to love the Lord our God with, with everything that we are. Right? Uh, in church, our soul, uh, it deeply longs for this eternal purpose that God has laid out for us. That he's, and he's given it to us for that. Does that make sense? And uh, that our soul, who we are, who God created us for, is always fighting and yearning, going after the eternal ideas of God. And, and church, uh, listen to this, Be because we have this eternal aspect of our soul, the temporary things of this world, a lot of the things that we focus in on, uh, whether it be material or non-material, the temporary things of this world will uh, never satisfy our, our eternal purpose of which that God has for us. It will never satisfy our eternal soul. Yet, as we've looked at, we chase after things of this world all the time, right? And if we're honest with ourselves, when it comes, to, when it comes down to it, uh, after pursuing and desiring and gathering up the things of this world, we find ourselves, after it's all the dust has settled and all the running around has happened, we find ourselves feeling empty and full of regret. How many of you have ever been in an emptiness and full of regret in your life? Right, just a few of us are honest here this morning, so that's good. Um, no, I don't want to cast that on anybody. But, but oftentimes we get to that point where we feel like, is this it? Is this it? Is this all life is? And we realize once we get there, once we get the house, the car, the kids— Man, I mean, it, we can even throw church in there, the job, the lifestyle, the sports, the school, the toys. That type of life and pursuing of that type of life is exhausting. It's exhausting to pursue those things. In church, there's, 
Again, there's nothing this world can offer you that will fully satisfy. Our scripture tells us, for we are God's workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for the works that he's prepared for us. The ones that he desires for us to do. And nothing else will satisfy that. The only thing that satisfies that desire in our life is the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ for us to press into and put our faith and trust in. And the way we do that, the way we experience that, the way that we work through that is a lot like what we've done these last few weeks. The idea of surrender, the idea of letting things go, the idea of trusting, the idea of pressing in and going after uh, who Jesus is, who he created us to be, and what he did for each one of us, right? The, I was trying to think of a better way to put it other than the lordship of Jesus, but that's what it is. It's allowing him to be uh, the lord of our lives, the lord over our lives, and allowing him to, to kind of direct our path and us fully trusting in that, his rule and reign in our lives, our whole life given to him. And I think what we can do is we can get in the habit of, we can get in the habit of allowing, allowing the gospel to be useful to us. I think it was, I think it was Jonathan Edwards that kind of started that idea, but the gospel being useful rather than something that is amazingly beautiful and interactive and in, 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 in an entirety focus. We just allow it to be uh, useful for us in our lives um, rather than where all of our hope is placed or rather than the only thing that we can have hope and faith and trust in, right? I think about it, and I thought about it this way. So with my mom, I just asked you guys to, to pray for her. And I think often I can think, like, the good news of Jesus and the hope and, and the love of Jesus, for me, take, goes to a whole nother level when I'm in a position like that, and I want, like, I, I want his rule and reign in this situation. I want to understand it. But then separate from that, uh, I want what I want. And I go after the things that are convenient for me, and I go after the things that make me comfortable. And, but then when it comes to, like, the usefulness of the gospel, like, then I'll press back into it, and I'll desire that, and I'll look and try to focus entire, entirely on that in my life. And I think that's that idea of just make the gospel, either it's just useful for us, something we just like flip on and off occasionally, or it's something that we actually apply and live in our lives. We tap into and trust. Uh, it's like we believe it for a, 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 a season or a reason rather than a life, right? Not fully. Uh, so if you want, uh, I'm going to read a scripture here in a second, and you can't get mad at me. Uh, I'm just the messenger. Uh, Romans 3, if you have a Bible, you can open up. That's where we're going to, we're going to, one more verse in Isaiah, but most of the time we're going to live here in Romans 3. Uh, uh, and if you don't have Bibles, there's Bibles in the back. And if you want like a, like if you need a study Bible, man, I would love to get you a study Bible. Let me know if you, if you need a Bible that you just need to read at home. Uh, and I would love to get that for you. But Romans 3, 10 through 12 says this. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away and all have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one, right? And like, I don't want anybody to throw anything at me now because we all fall under that no one. In case you didn't know, you were part of the no one. Um, and, uh, and, like, and I think of people in my life. Like I'm, I'm so glad Ruth is here because I, she made my sermon uh, like Ruth, ni 92, right? 92 year old, 91? 92 year old Ruth is not even righteous, right? Or I think, uh, I think I saw Ann, maybe Ann's down with the kids. Like, I always think of like, Ann is righteous, right? Or my wife, like, my wife is righteous, um, <laughs> right? But not even your old, your dear old grandma or your grandpa or those, that person in faith that you talked about, like that influenced your faith today, like not even righteous, right? 
Not even one, that, that verse in Romans said. And I think for me, uh, I, I, when, I, when, I, when I wrote that verse down on the paper, I was like reluctant. I was like, no, 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 no. Not going to go there. Nobody's good. Everybody's sick. Everybody, you know, like I didn't want to go there. And let me tell you why. It wasn't because I was worried about what you guys think, right? Which is normally what influences me pretty good. Like if I say that, are they going to, like, what are they? I, I, I don't, I, I'm reluctant towards that verse only because I find myself using it as an excuse. As an excuse to, to not worry about the lifestyle that I live. Right? No one's righteous, so pfft, I can just not be righteous, right? And I'll have to desire the things, or there's a good excuse as to why I don't, because nobody actually does, right? And as I look back over the times in my life and the areas, the reasons and the seasons of my life that I re regret or reject God, I can read that verse and feel all right about myself. And be like, well, I'm good in, I mean, at least in good company, right? I'm part of the everybody and the no one, right? Um, but, but it is our fallen nature. So in Genesis, um, uh, God is creating man. And, and I love that image of, in Genesis where God actually like uh, knelt down and breathed life into Adam. Like the creator of the universe didn't just say, let there be life. Like he bent down and he, he, you know, scripture says that he gathered dirt together and made Adam. Adam is, is from the dirt is the translation of that. But that from the dirt, God knelt down and breathed life into Adam. And then in creation, it says that uh, he realized that it wasn't good for man to be alone. So he uh, created from man, woman, and uh, gave us the jobs and the commands and the, the way of life that we were created to, uh, to operate here on earth. And uh, both men and women, and, and, and we give Eve a hard time. We do, because like, we're like, well, Eve bit the apple first, and she's the one that picked it from the tree. You know, like, it's like passive Adam was right there with Eve, uh, it says in Scripture, and they both partook of that fruit. And, uh, and took the forbidden fruit and at that point rejected God. So fallen, my excuse as to why I continue uh, at, at time and in certain places and spaces to reject God uh, is, is from that nature of which entered in at that moment. And uh, uh, however, it not being an excuse, like I said, I struggle with it just as an excuse for me, I want to own up to my rejection of God, of why I continue to reject God. And I want to make it right myself, fully knowing that I cannot, as hard as I, and we talked about this in the past series, as hard as I want to work and, and, uh, and build up and establish things on my own, there is nothing I can do or work to achieve that will lessen the penalty of, reject, of rejecting God in my life, right? Rejecting, playing that role of rejecting sin in my life. Now, I need myself to be accountable for my own sin, right? I need to be accountable for my own sin. I need to own up uh, the way I reject God in my life, the way I contribute to the problem, right? Uh, excuses or not, it's when we think we can just go on and do whatever and choose and do and live the life however I want to live that uh, to the contrary to, to what, what we're designed to do, that's when we get into trouble. That's when we kind of uh, stray from, be led astray from what God has for us, right? How we were designed to live. So Romans 3.19 then says, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. So it's speaking to the people who are under the law, those that are following Jesus, so that, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. So there's an aspect of knowing the law, 
There's an aspect of, you know, I think it's 613 laws in here in the Old Testament. There's an aspect of knowing the law, and there's many lessons that Jesus taught in the New Testament. There's an aspect of knowing the law and knowing the need for the law, and to be conscious and aware of that there is a problem, that I myself have a problem that I continue to go to the area of rejecting God in certain areas of my life, the seasons and reasons or the places and spaces, whatever you want to uh, call them or however you want to be aware of them. And, 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 I, and I heard it put this way. This is not uh, my creative idea, but man, it, it shook me this week because I've heard it put this way, that the word of God is like a mirror, right? And when we stand in front of a mirror if, as if it was the word of God, our life then should reflect the life that God desires for us to have. The desires for us to look. As I look at the word of God, my life should reflect the word of God. That's ultimately what our hope is, right? And, and, and I, think, I think this is going to work. Looks like all, all of you stood in front of a mirror today before you came here. Uh, but we woke up this morning, right? And each one of us probably stood in front of, front of a mirror. We got out of bed. Uh, whether it was a good sleep or not a good sleep, like we stood in front of a mirror and thought, man, I got some work I need to do, right? If I'm going to get to church and if I'm going to present myself in public, I need to do some things. I need to write some things, right? So here's what I know that none of you did this morning. None of you got up this morning, looked in the mirror, and then said, man, I need to get a new mirror, right? Right? Heather, man, this mirror's broken, right? But isn't that kind of what we do with God's Word? Like, we look at, and we're like, ah, I need a new mirror. I'm going to create a new mirror that looks the way that I want it to look in my life. And here's another thing that we can do, maybe we, I mean, you probably didn't do this morning either, is that you didn't blame your bed for the way you looked. You might have been able to blame some young kids that you have running around the house or whatever for the raggedness of the way you looked and needing to present that. But ultimately, there's an aspect of just taking, taking it on yourself and getting yourself to be presentable. Now, I don't want, that analogy isn't like we have to look good. That's just an analogy used to the, to the idea of, of needing to know that there's a problem that needs to be solved uh, when it comes to the truth of what God and the reflection of our life and the way that uh, we should live, right? And so in order for us to, to understand that there's a problem and then to desire the outcome that ultimately that God would have for us in our lives. In church, we need to be conscious of our sin. We need to be conscious to know that we have a problem. And oftentimes I think that I choose to not maybe even be aware of the problem that is presenting itself or acknowledge the problem in the first place. And Romans 3.20 says this, Therefore no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we became conscious of our sin. Right? Through the law, through the right way of living, through God's design for us to live, we become then conscious of our sin. That the law, does, uh, the law doesn't produce uh, eternal life in God, right? So it says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in the sight of by the works. So we know that it's separate from the works. No one will be declared righteous by being able to fulfill all of the works of the law. That's what it says there, right? Uh, that declare, no one will, be, will de be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. So the law doesn't produce eternal life just as much as the perfect life that we are choosing, that we are trying to achieve will not produce eternal life either. Right? If it isn't the life of pictured 2.3 kids, minivan, white picket fence, uh, that works of the law, maybe it's, you know, I mean, we can throw in a 10 church, we can throw in give to charity, serve with the kids or the needy or help a neighbor or 
whatever. Like, that aspect of life doesn't produce the eternal life that God desires for us. That for us, oftentimes we can do separate from like, I don't cheat, murder, steal, or lie, which, I mean, I can throw cheat out of there, right? Because how many of you are competitive? If we're competitive, we probably, you know, cut a corner every now and again. Uh, so uh, how many of you, how many of you are a liar? So just a handful of us. How many of you have internet or a cell phone? Go ahead and raise your hand if you have internet or a cell phone. So how about, uh, <laughs> this is funny, I heard it put this way. Uh, the box that says, uh, I have read all the terms and conditions, and then you click yes. If you have internet or a cell phone, there it is. Like, we all click that box. How many of you have actually read all the terms and conditions? Oh, sweet. We're, we're getting there. We're getting honest, right? We're getting honest this morning, right? But we have to acknowledge it. And we don't realize or we don't, uh, we don't like, play the game of ignorance and flirt with the idea that I've got it all figured out. That, man, uh, that I'm going to change the mirror to what I want it to look like. I'm going to change the life to the way I want it to look like because I have it all figured out. And that's church when we get in trouble. And, and it doesn't take too long for us to get down to the road where then I can ask myself, and, and you can ask yourself this, like, how's that working out for you? How's that working out for you? And I find it, raising teenagers myself and kids, I find it like a, a, a tad or a, I don't even know, tish is tish, tish bit, a little bit, uh, scary that we tell our kids that they can kind of do and be whatever they want, knowing that there is consequences down the road to the decisions that they make now in their life. And we think it's all right to do that. Because this is what hit me this week, is that I realized that for me, the decisions I made, which were minor, minor decisions, like little decisions compared to what m my teenagers are faced with today, uh, they still impact and affect my life today. Like, they still are very much a part of my relationship with my wife. They're still very much a part of uh, how I view myself today. And because of that, I know that the decisions my kids are making now or the decisions we're even making now will directly impact our future. And Romans 3.20 says, And now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. So separate from the law, the righteousness of God has now been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness comes from something different than the law, something different than the works. It is separate from that. It is separate from anything I can conjure up and create on my own. It's bigger than you and your ability to achieve and accomplish and build up something that you think will qualify you or, or get you to the place that you want to get in your life. Right? 322, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ, Christ for all believers. Romans 322. So it ends with, to which the law and the prophets testify, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all believers, for all who believe, not just a select few, not just a few that have that perfect life nailed out, not just people who live a certain way or have a certain uh, demographic or uh, econ ec economical or social environment, like for all who believe, righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. And here's the deal, like as I stand up here and, and share funny stories about how I often fall short and how I'm struggling just as much as you, or I get to share a funny story about looking in a mirror or how I stole something from a convenience store or whatever it may be, uh, I very much hope that when I get to talk and hang out with you guys that you hear the gospel of Jesus when I, when I share with you.
that you hear the good news of the life that Jesus has for you. Because that is why I do what I do. And for me, it took a second as I looked through Scripture to realize that that story is written all over in Scripture. Like, the complete story is told in numerous times throughout the Old Testament, in numerous times throughout the New Testament. It's paralleled in stories of other people's lives throughout Scripture. I could just, I mean, the, 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 the ideas of that and the story being told, I could just spend hours reading each story like that, right? And as we have already looked at Genesis, we get the story in Genesis, right? God says, Genesis, God says to the serpent who tempted Eve to, to eat of the apple, he says to the servant, he says, Eve's offspring will rise up and his heel will crush your head. That's laying the groundwork for the one that is to come. That is a foretelling of Jesus defeating the evil. Defeating Satan, right? And all of the sacrifices that are full in the Old Testament, I often try to wrestle with, like, why'd they have to, why'd they have to bring two goats up every year? One scapegoat that runs off, and then the second one they'd kill, and then they'd spread the blood, and like, like why did that happen? Pointing back to Jesus. That eventually, well, that inevitably, that each one of us need, need a sacrifice for the penalty of our sins. And that year after year they would do this, they'd have this day of atonement, right? And they have this day of atonement because, man, living up to the 613 laws is pretty hard. And they don't always get it right. And so the stories all throughout Scripture point back to Jesus over and over and over again in our lives. Isaiah 53, 3-5 says, He was despised and rejected by mankind, talking of Jesus, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one whom people hide their face, he was despised. And he was held in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet considering him punished by God, stricken to him and afflicted. But he has been pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that, was brought, that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. That it is through Jesus' sacrifice that we are healed. It is through Jesus' sacrifice that we're brought back into right relationship with him. It is not by the things that we do. Church, we cannot do better or try harder to accomplish what Jesus has already accomplished in our lives. John said it at Jesus' baptism, right? He said, Behold the Lamb of God who has come to take away the sin of all of mankind. Not just Travis's, and not just Paul's or Kurt's, like all of mankind. He's not just a scapegoat or another animal sacrifice. Like it is finished. He did it. He paid it in full. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all believers. And then in verse 23, for all who have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There it is again. We all have. We are in good company. It's not an excuse, but we all have. And then it's the good news. And are justified. So all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. I was trying to think of this idea of redemption. <laughs> and I thought about, do you remember, I mean, you remember Easter? Just a little bit ago. Remember the coin shop in Bellingham that, that like put eggs all over town? Like some of you were lucky enough to find some of those eggs and you, you would just take that little piece of paper and you would go to that shop and redeem a, a, a free gift. Like it cost you nothing. And you found an egg. We found a bunch of eggs out here on the, out on the playground when we were hiding our eggs. Uh, for the Easter egg hunt, right? And so uh, we weren't timely enough to go and turn them in. Um, but, uh, 
But that's that idea of redemption. That in exchange, free of charge for what we have done, Jesus laid down his life for us. We're justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Verse 25. From whom God put forth as a pro propitiation. Pro propitiation. So that's just a fancy Christian word. Did I do it? Faith, faith gave me a thumbs up. Um, but here's the deal. It's atonement. Well, that's another word that's like, what's well, atonement? It's a, an appeasement. Okay, well, I don't know. It's satisfied. How many get satisfied, right? I pressed into satisfied. I had to go like four down the list on my Logos software to find something that I was like, all right, I'm going to wrap my head around satisfied. Because here's the deal. Jesus' penalty satisfied. That means for those that are in Christ, there is no dissatisfied. I don't know about you, but it's very easy for me to go that God's dissatisfied with me. Or that I've done something that, where I've become dissatisfied. Somebody's become dissatisfied. But if we look at propitiation okay? and we view it as that idea of it was paid there is full uh, atonement, appeasement full satisfying for each one of us by his blood to be received by faith then I can separate myself from the dissatisfied rejection that I feel then it goes on to say, this, is, this was to show God's righteousness because of his design forbearance. Whew. Mercy. God's mercy that he passed over former sins, like the sins that, have, that I've done up until that point, God's mercy, right, has passed over former sins, and it shows his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just. How many think God's justice can sometimes be a little scary? Right? But so that God can be just. And I think for us, oftentimes it's really easy for us to, uh, like I said, for me, struggle to just look over sin because we're the sinner. Like it's a part of who I am and how I operate. And so it's easy for me to look over it. It's not the case with God right? God, the creator of it all, sinless son Jesus, uh, doesn't get the idea of looking past my own, his own sin, because he was perfect. It was that perfect sacrifice. So that he might be just in the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That God is satisfied for those that have received the forgiveness and the cleansing of Jesus in his mercy in his payment of being uh, 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 to bring to bring his justice, and here's the deal, church: the only thing that can truly mend, that can truly grow, that can truly restore uh, our soul and the desire of our soul is the grace of how of of our God, who through the redemption, uh, and this is all that we've talked about through the redemption of Jesus. That's the only thing that can truly bring about that restoration in our lives. It's because of God's justice, our sin must be paid for. And it's because of God's mercy uh, that our payment has been delayed. That he didn't, uh, the moment I sinned like five, 44 years, 40 years ago, I don't know, first recognition of sin, that he didn't just squash me in my place. It's his mercy that it's been delayed, and it's God's grace that he's then made the payment for us through Christ. And then now, for us, it's our ability to then live through that grace, to live out of that grace, to, to realize that I serve a God that, that is not dissatisfied in me, but that has something more for me. 
that I serve a God that, that actually desires for me to live my life in a certain way. And he desires for me to press into him and what he has for us. And it's out of his grace that I get to then press into that and live in the amazement of who he is, in his power, in his purpose, in his uh, presence all the time, in his uh, in his all-knowing, in, in, his, in, in his authorship and creatorship of everything, in his desire for me to, 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 to live the life that he desires for me, to get the most out of life, to get the uh, desires that he has for me out of life. And it's out of that grace that then we get to live. I'm going to invite the band to come forward. And church, I want us to, as we close with these last two songs, <clears throat> oh, Allison's going to need that. I want us to take an opportunity to just in this moment praise him from that grace, out of that grace. Like, Acknowledge the grace and then press into what, what it is that he would want us to interact with him about, right? That he would desire for us to live into. Um, it's not like a tangible let go of something or a, a, a stand if you need prayer kind of thing, but more of a, man, being presented with the idea of God's grace in my life and the life I get to live because of that grace brings me to a point of 